whenever you're ready, uh, you can just go ahead and introduce yourself and we'll take it from there. Well, thanks, Mike. I'm a long-term airline pilot, uh, 24,000 hour retired United captain, uh, currently working for uh, Delta Professional Services as an ATP CTP instructor, spent uh, seven years at Boeing. But my piloting really isn't my expertise. I mean, I'm an experienced pilot, but along the way, I've been running a pilot career information service. I uh, started out as FAPA and then Air Inc., Aviation Information Resources, and finally now just kitdarby.com. And over the years, 25 years or so, we've helped about 200,000 pilots uh, working toward their uh, professional pilot goals. And they've tried a lot of different things. A lot of those things worked. Uh, some of those things didn't. So what I'm here to do is try to help chart the course to get you from where you are to where you want to be and do it at the benefit of the experience of these couple of hundred thousand pilots that have gone before you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kit. So we'll, we'll just jump right into it. Uh, and we've got some questions uh, directly from the viewer, viewers, but also I want you to, to answer some specific stuff uh, that I think everyone can benefit from. So the, the very first question I want to ask you, Kit, is with the coronavirus pandemic, is it still a good time to pursue a pilot career? Well, Mike, there's a lot of questions about the virus still. We don't know how bad it's going to get, although it's about as bad as it can get right now. And we don't know how long it's going to last. It does seem to be improving in some areas, perhaps not nationwide, but we're headed in the right direction. So without knowing how long it's going to last or how bad it's going to get, uh, we're going to say that the based on previous problems, we've looked at medical problems like uh, SARS, we've looked at uh, security problems like 9-11, uh, uh, we've looked at economic problems like a, the recession, the Great Recession and the one we had recently. Mm -hmm. So these give us a model of, of how long it might take. Uh, and if I could, I'd like to bring up a slide that shows uh, what that recovery might look like. Please and, do. Okay. So, the, uh, so here is a, um, we have a lot, of, a lot of possible ways for this to work. And the green, blue, and purple lines sort of show us what the options are. So this is the left side of a V where we go in very quickly. And then we have the bottom, which is we, we stay low for a while. That's the bottom of a U shape. Uh, and it comes back and at some point it begins to level off again. And that would be an L shape. So it's down and then to the right. So these are possible one year, two year, three year models. And it's hard to say which one we're gonna do. If I had to pick one today, I would say uh, two years plus the portion of the U. So we're at two and a half, three years uh, before we're back. But at the point that we're back, uh, we're 100% of where we are today, and that was in a pilot shortage, needing a lot of pilots. It's gonna be assisted, however, by the retirements. This is the retirement at our major airlines, and I've, I've got you American marked in, in the larger red line. And that shows that that airline's retiring almost 1,000 pilots a year for several years in the future. When you put that all together, uh, it comes out like this. I've added in estimated corporate uh, fractional and earlier medical retirements. And we see that we come up starting going forward here, about 4,100 pilots a year needed just to replace retiring pilots. So we can add that, uh, that's up, added up, sort of looks like this. And uh, when we Put it cumulative, though, it shows that we need you know, 80,000 pilots in the next 20 years. That's almost as many airline pilots as we have today. And finally, to put it all together, we have the normal recovery chart, which I showed you earlier, the yellow line being the RPM, revenue passenger mile recovery. But on top of that, we have to replace these retiring pilots. So instead of getting back to 100% in uh, three years, we actually get back in less than way less than three years, perhaps even two years, based on the in continued retirement of these pilots reaching age 65. And there are gonna be a lot of pilots that leave uh, before 65. American just got uh, 700 pilots to retire early as part of their recovery plan. So these are added together. Uh, if you're gonna take pilot training, and it typically takes a couple of three years, two to three years to get your training, and build the experience you need to qualify to be an airline pilot. That would be 1,500 hours. So if it's gonna take you two years and during this downturn, you're training, that's a good thing. And by the time you're 
trained and experienced enough to get the job, then the pilot market has returned. So it can still be a good time to do your pilot training. That's a great time, actually, because nobody's getting in front of you. No, no other pilots are being hired. So you're, you're basically able to sort of hold the line while you get qualified and experienced. And when they're back to hiring, you'll be ready. Wow. Okay, great. So based on everything you just said, what you're saying is you're expecting the market to recover within two to three years. And for those uh, pilots who are looking to either start now or are interested in starting a, a, their pilot journey, this is a good time to do it is what you're saying. And also, I may have heard there that you're also saying that by the time you get done building your hours uh, for the airlines, if that's the route you want to go, there will be less competition to get hired. Did that, did, I mean, did I read that wrong? Or that's that's that was what you meant by what you no, said No, that's earlier. correct. There will be a lot of competition in the middle here where some pilots will be furloughed. And that's, uh, you know, when you have too many pilots, uh, a furlough is... is you are not working, but you have a right of recall, meaning as they begin to need pilots coming back up here, they recall those existing pilots. And right about here, two to three years, they begin to hire new pilots again. So the, all the stuff above the line are additional pilots. So if you're qualified here, then they start hiring pilots, we'd say off the street, new pilots again, you're in the right position. You know, the job, of course, is to be trained experienced, meet all the minimum qualifications and exceed them if you can to be the best available candidate when they start hiring new pilots again in two to three years. Okay. That, that sounds like good news. So if you're, if you're out there and you're having second thought about this, uh, hopefully this answers your question. Now you mentioned Kit that you would need about 1500 hours to get into the airlines, uh, to, to fly for the airlines. So can you talk to us a little bit more about some of the qualifications that someone would need uh, to fly professionally for the airlines? We were, at, we were talking about the, the licenses, uh, education, the requirements that you need to, uh, to get this job. And uh, it's different at different levels. But if we're going to shoot for the top level, the major airlines, the top corporations, the top cargo companies, then this is the level we're looking at. So starting out, you have to get a private instrument commercial license. Most people get a CFI, uh, all three aircraft instrument and multi-engine. Um, Education-wise, you can start out with a high school diploma, but if you want to work at the highest level, you're going to need to achieve a four-year degree. Now, about half the majors require one, the other half prefer one, and they prefer it at a very high percentage, uh, mid-90 percentiles. So half require it, and the other half do... 90 plus, so we're looking at a you know only 5% would get hired without a four-year degree at the highest level. The smaller airlines wouldn't care. You could work with a high school diploma or a couple of years of college, they would be fine with that. The total flight time, the race is really on to 1,500 hours. And you can work cargo a little sooner. You have to have some other qualifications in there, a multi-engine rating, 50 hours of experience, you know, cross-country night, instrument experience. So there's a breakdown that it's in the regulations, easy to check. But that's the qualifications that you're going to need along with 1,500 hours of experience to be ready for an airline position. Uh, okay. So to add to that, is there an age cutoff? Uh, so a lot of viewers have asked, they're, they're much older or they perhaps want to have a career change so if you wanted to fly for the airlines today, is there a limit or a ceiling to how old you have to be? There's not a limit up to the limit of the age to work, which is 65 now. So if you're over 65, you can't work in these positions. But if you're under 65, there's really no age discrimination. Back when I was hired, they, the max age was 32 or 33. Uh, they were able to enforce that. They're no longer able to enforce that, and that's gone away. So they hire pilots right up into their early 60s now. So there is no age limit for career changers. A lot of people are leaving one career to another, and they're later in life. Uh, there, it simply means you won't be at the airline as long. Perhaps you won't fly the biggest plane or make the maximum money, but you certainly can be a, a co-pilot on a big airplane, uh, and you can make captain. Typical captains are in 8 to 10 years. Uh, so if you have more than that, then you could also be a captain, which is the higher pay rate, and the pay rate determines your retirement as well. 
Okay, can you speak a little bit on that pay rate? So if I'm fresh out of, you know, I, I've got all my qualifications, 1,500 hours, all the ratings I need, and I, I'm just starting today. Because just a few months ago, we've heard of new pilots getting bonuses just to get hired because of the shortage. What Do you expect that to still be the case? And also, at what what is the typical starting salary for a, a fresh new hired pilot? Okay, well, I'm going to um, share my screen again here so we can look at a chart. Okay. Uh, so I know this is a lot of information, but the hourly rate is on the left side. So one year, five year, and maximum first officer rate. Doesn't really go much above five years as the max rate. And then we have captains at five years, 10 years, and maximum. And a way to estimate what that is worth is to put three zeros at the end of it. So Air West Constant at $37 an hour is $37,000 a year. Uh, in five years, 48. And you would probably be a captain uh, in five years. That would have you know, been two or three years. That's going to go up a little bit with the effects of the virus, uh, but it'll come back down as well. And then if you look on the captain section, the CPT section, the uh, the jobs go up to uh, you know $120,000 uh, a year, which is a really good job, way above the national average. In fact, the averages are at the bottom. So in blue there, uh, 42 would be an average of 42,000, uh, the mid 50, and the largest co-pilot would be 53,000, captain 82,000, tenure captain 96, and maximum captain uh, 116,000. So that's that's pretty good money. Uh, so this is a, pr a pretty good job. The co-pilot's job, uh, certainly not compared to the captain at the regional or the first officer or captain at the major. However, there's been a series of bonuses. If you look at the second column from the right, it says the first year bonus. And that bonus uh, has averaged um, you know, around 16,000 uh, from zero to 40,000, depending on the airline. And those bonuses are what's at risk right now. Whether they'll continue with the downturn, uh, with uh, having too many pilots for a while, they'll either get smaller or go away entirely. So we can't count on those bonuses. With the bonus, the average has been uh, 58,000 a year. Without the bonus, it's going to be more like 42. So wow. if you can, again, it's a big difference, but 42 is when I started doing this 15 years ago and it stayed the same for almost 10 years, the bottom pay was about 23,000 and it stayed there until about five years ago. And then it's come up in, in just four to five years from 23 to 42 without the bonus and from 23 to 60 with the bonus. So as they get back into hiring, you know, two or three years from now, I expect those bonuses will return because they'll once again be a shortage. Okay, that's great. So you, we have an idea what the salary is for the airliners or regional air airlines. What about the corporate pilot and perhaps other, other professions as a pilot? What, what should you expect to make in your salary every year uh, if you decided to go a different route? Okay, well, let's. Uh, we're going to share the screen again for the purpose of uh, showing some slides. Can you see that? Okay. Yes. All right. So this is a, a NBAA National Business Aircraft Association Corporate Compensation Survey. It is proprietary to that organization. Uh, I have contacts, and I'm able to get a copy of it. And then I, it, it's a several hundred page book, very detailed, breaks it out by size of airplane, duty position, uh, regions of the country, size of the company, very, very detailed. Too detailed for us to cover it here. The good news is that we have um, a uh, summary of it that I've made. I've, been, I've done this over the years. So it's uh, the first officer on the left and captain on the right. And then it has uh, the different size airplanes. It starts at the bottom. So in the middle, you see the years, 1 through 20. So starting in the bottom, typical corporate pilot working for these, and these are the better corporations in America. Um, starting at the bottom, small airplane starts out at 95,000. On a medium-sized airplane, 135. On a larger airplane, uh, 158 a year. And it goes up at the top, and it sort of maxes out about... Uh, 10 years, 116 small airplane, 164 medium airplane, 192, uh, and, and that's good stuff. They're, they do have some very large airplanes. 
Uh, they do have some uh, uh, airliners, for instance, and they, they pay pretty good. So this wow. is the average co-pilot compensation across the three. So it's a pretty good job. And then wow. on the captain side, uh, 147 in a small airplane, 200,000 medium, 231, and then it goes up to 270, uh, and it goes up to 10 years. So th these are really good jobs. And they, they, they typically fly, like I said, 20 to 40 hours a month. They have excellent equipment. They have the, everybody thinks airliners are the best equipment. I can tell you that the top corporate airplanes have uh, the best, fanciest, most up-to-date equipment. They'll buy an airliner, and they're going to fly it for 20, 25 years. You fly a corporate jet, and they're going to get a new one every so often, and it's going to be the very latest stuff. So that's, that's the compensation at the corporate. And let me sh move on to the regionals we looked at already. Here's the major airlines, uh, and we start out with the first year, uh, and these are the different airlines, and the average monthly and the average annual in the second year. So average on the first year, 73, second year, 109, third year, 135, fourth year, 143, 161. Making captain, I say cap, most people make captain eight to 10 years. So I say captain in 11 years and the average captain at 11 years is 243 and the max captain is 278. Now cargo does a little better lower in the first year, but better toward the end. So 278 for a passenger captain max average and 338 for a cargo max captain. Wow. Now the top regional airlines, the uh, top uh, major airlines do as well. So you see 28,000, you know, Delta, United, American come pretty close to that. So uh, overall, it's a really good job. What you don't see here, and I, I will... I have to add that to my analysis, is there's about 15% uh, benefits. Your medical, dental, insurance, all, they have excellent benefits. They also have a company paid retirement. So each year, in addition to this amount that the company pays you, they put 16% in addition to it into your retirement. Wow. So that's a company paid, fully company paid retirement at 16%. And all of them have it. Delta, United, American. <laughs> Used to be some of these smaller companies the smaller majors didn't have that. And in the last few years, they've all gotten it. So you take this number plus 15% benefits, plus 16% retirement, plus profit sharing that averaged about 10%. Not going to be any profit sharing for the next few years, but over the last decade, profit sharing is, is averaged about 10% uh, for these companies. So you add 15% re benefits, 15, 16% retirement, 10% profit sharing. We're talking... 40% in addition to these numbers you see here, these are really good careers. And you're doing that work in 15 days a month. That, wait, wait, this is crazy. I, I've actually never heard of the profit sharing. Can you can you talk just a little bit more about that? I didn't know that that was a thing. Well, the profit sharing, uh, Delta is the company I'm most familiar with because uh, I work there. Um, and their profit sharing has been as high as 21.4% but averaged about 10%. So if you take 20% 20, 20 of, of a big round number, let's say this is you know, 250, 20% of that is $50,000 in profit sharing that year. I mean, that's really big money. That's I mean, that's not, that's not a new car, that's a new luxury car. <laughs> so, uh, and, the, and the fact that your retirement, when it's growing at 16% of this every year, and it grows with interest, when you work a 30 year career and retire, your retirement would be between three and four million dollar lump sum. That's, you put that in the bank and live on the interest for the rest of your life. That is that is amazing. Honestly, when you when you mentioned earlier that the value of a pilot career or airline pilot career is ten million dollars, my brain started to think, okay, does it mean did you mean value as in just the total value, or this is actually when you add up your salary and the benefits. And what you're saying is the numbers add up. In 20, 30 years, you would have earned that much money and then still have a few million dollars to sit back on for retirement. Well, the 10, the 10 million is an average for all these companies uh, over a, a 30 year career. So it is pay, benefits, and retirement. Wow. So it includes all of those. Still, and it's, uh, sorry, go ahead. So that that's the it's it's pay and we call it career value pay benefits and retirement. I'm an expert witness. I 
uh, build career value models for pilots that are injured, delayed, or killed. Um, I build these all the time. I have one made for each major airline. So the top ones, you know, the cargo companies and the Delta United and American, their averages are closer to 13 or 14 million. The overall average is 10, but the big, the bigger and best companies are closer to 13 or 14 million. So, and that, again, today's dollars, it'll be a lot more dollars if you're getting hired today, 30 years from now, that'll be a much bigger number. That's uh, 10 to 13 million in today's dollars. Wow. Constant dollars. That, that so. is, that is amazing. That's, that's a lot to chew on. <laughs> uh, that's a lot to chew on. And I, I think for a lot of people who are either considering this career path or just on the fence of it, perhaps this is some motivation. Obviously you shouldn't just do anything just because of the money. But when you compare this to other careers, it's just, it's insane not to, not to really give this a chance because I know I have a few friends right now who are at least a hundred thousand dollars in debt and student loans and still can't get a job in the normal market. And then you have this career path as a pilot where you can earn this type of money. And I feel like a lot of people are not even informed about it or don't, don't really know the numbers. So this is, this is something I'm even learning about. I, I didn't know that these benefits and profit sharing, I, I didn't know these exist uh, as a pilot. Well, in our society, it's uh, improper to talk about income. You know, pilots are, uh, it's, it, if, if you talk about it, it's inappropriate. Uh, if your mother talks about it, uh, they'll put up with her for a little while and then they throw her out of the room. <laughs> you know, you just, it's not appropriate to talk about income, but it is a significant income. And people say, well, why would you be gone, you know, 10 nights a month? Why, why would you put up with the lower pay in the beginning years? Why would you do that? Well, this is why you would do that. People say, I wouldn't move. I want to, I got to stay at home. I want to live in, you know, some obscure city and I don't right. want to commute. And then you, you see these numbers and you know, well, yeah, you could live there and commute to work or maybe for this much money you should move. You know, I mean, you can live really well uh, on uh, 20,000 a month. So, yeah. and it takes a while to get there. I mean, that you're, that you're not going to get it right away. Another thing about this particular career we're looking at is in the beginning, like with ups and downs, you can get furloughed now, just like it's going to happen to some pilots in the current uh, recession. So it's up and down. But at the same time, toward the end of it, when you get over toward the right side and you've been there 10, 15, 20 years, you're not going to get furloughed. You, it's very secure toward the end where the job is the very best. So I was making comparably this kind of money when I retired and I was working eight or nine days a month. I wow. mean, that's a really good job. A, a, you can run a business, you can pursue a sport, you can spend time with the kids, you know, it's that's, a lot of useful time and, and the money enough to enjoy it. Not to mention you now have low cost or no cost travel. You know, for many of these airlines, there's no charge to travel worldwide now uh, throughout the year. So with that kind of money and that kind of time off, if you want, you can see the world. That's crazy. The, the, the benefits is, I, I mean, it's almost comparable to what you get in the military in some, some ways. You can travel for free. You have all this health uh, benefits and retirement. It's just, it's crazy to me that so many people are not even considering uh, this, this career path. But I'm, I'm hoping this will open some eyes and really give this a, a good shot. Uh, and you, you sort of answered one of the questions I was going to ask. You said towards your retirement, you were working maybe eight to 10 hours a month because one of the questions, which we'll probably get to more in uh, in the next video series is uh, some some viewers ask, can I fly part time? Is this something that I can do part time? Uh, so you sort of answered that. It, it, obviously, perhaps you wouldn't fly part time in the beginning, but once you get towards the end of your uh, pilot career, you you will have the time to be able to perhaps commit to to other things. Uh, or did I read that wrong? Is that what you're well, saying? You, you said uh, days this time. It's actually, I mean, you said hours, but it's actually days. So nine to 10 days. I mean, sorry, I, I meant yeah. days, eight to, yeah. <laughs> eight eight to eight 10 to, days, not hours. Yes. Eight to 10, eight to 10 days. days. And, and that um, is significant time yeah. off. But of course, those, those were flights where you're going, you know, Los, Los Angeles, Paris for 12 hours and 15 minutes and coming back, you know, a day later. So you flew 24 hours or 25 hours uh, in three days. Wow. So uh, you get a lot of time off, but you work really hard to get it. Okay. 
Now, for some who are not necessarily interested in flying for the airlines, you mentioned earlier that uh, for cargo, for example, you may be required to have lesser uh, flight hours. So can you talk to us a little bit about other options that is open to a new pilot? Uh, if they don't want to work for the airlines, could be either because of the tight schedule or whatever the case may be. So what other options are available outside of flying for the airlines? Okay, well, let's talk about two options. First of all, there's an option on how to build experience and then the option of where to work other than the airlines. So to build experience, most people do it as an instructor, a CFI, a certificated flight instructor. Most people say certified, but it's actually certificated. And, and that is what most people do. Not everybody wants to be an instructor. Uh, the airlines have been trained that they, they, the saying is that you don't really know it till you teach it. So when you teach it, you learn it really well. And the airlines have come to really like experienced instructors. So if you're trying to work for a regional airline, it's hardly a better way to build experience than as a flight instructor. But there's lots of other things, but they're small segments. Most people do it as a CFI, but there's traffic watch, banner towing, fish spotting, ferrying aircraft. You can possibly work corporate jobs or crop dusting. There's ISR contracting, government. ISR is intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, flying King Airs overseas on, on primarily a military mission. You don't have to be a military pilot to get the job. Uh, and then, of course, the military options, guard and reserve flying, a great way to learn to fly at their expense, make a little money. The trouble is there's a commitment there. If you're active, you're not available. But if you're guard and reserve, you are available. So it's a great option. So once you get your experience, and then if you didn't want to be an airline pilot, what could you do? Well, there's a lot of options there too. But again, the airlines hire have almost 100,000 pilots at the majors. And, and that's a ton of pilots, and that's where most of the jobs are. But you can do other things. So I'm uh, looking at that. You can do corporate, uh, and corporate sort of has two arms. One is uh, flying for an individual corporation, and the other is fractional flying, where they timeshare an airplane. People like NetJets, uh, FlexJet, where you work work with them uh, and staff their plane, and they lease shares of the plane to business customers. So corporate is a uh, is easier to get into if you know somebody. Uh, it can be very difficult, even if well-qualified, if you don't know somebody. So I say it's very much who you know. So your connections, your network become very important in getting any job, but particularly important in the corporate segment. So there's a charter. You, know, you can work charter. Uh, there's flight instruction. Some people make a career at a, as a flight instructor. Uh, a lot of different things you can do, but there are the most jobs and the best paying jobs with the best retirement, the most time off are at the airlines. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the costs, okay? Because I think that's one of the biggest barriers in getting into aviation or flying in general. So there's a, there's a cost that comes with your training and getting all of the, the ratings that you need. And as a lot of you know, I work together with Sling Pilot Academy based in Torrance, and they have this accelerated program that takes you from zero to commercial uh literally within a year for about sixty three or sixty four thousand dollars now for a lot of people out there that is a lot of money now in your experience what would you say is is the average cost or a good cost to spend on this and you know a lot of people who are taking this route they're obviously trying to do this as a career so is the cost does the means justify the end, I guess, is, is what I'm asking. And also, can you give us some of the costs that somebody who is starting out should look forward to? And also, uh, programs like what they offer at the Sling Pilot Academy, would you would you recommend that for most career pilots? Or do you recommend more like flexible, you know, go in and out, whatever the case may be? So what's, what's your take on it? Well, uh, it's hard to do better than full-time flight training. So the academy, like the Sling Academy, where you go in and fly full-time until you're qualified, that's fast. Uh, it does spend a lot of money quickly. Uh, however, you're available in the job market quickly and begin to earn again. So if you can do that, that is by far the best way to do it. It's an immersion-type training where that's all you do. So we don't need you uh, coming and going into the training market. It takes a lot longer that way. 
But a lot of pilots have to do that. Uh, if you don't have the way to finance that, and we can talk about the different ways to do that, but if you can't make that happen, if you just can't do the $63,000 or so, and that's, a, that's a, a typical cost. It could be a little more, a little less, not much less. It's one of the better deals out there. Uh, but at the same time, it's uh, the, by getting done quickly, the, the opportunity cost, the, the chance going forward to make money, earning money, that's a great opportunity. So if you get done quickly, you're back in the job market and you're making money, that saves you thousands and thousands of dollars. So you can't just look at the cost of the program. You have to look at how long it takes to complete the program. So the cost, you know, again, just for flight training is a good deal there. Uh, but the real benefit is that you're done quickly. And then, of course, you're, you're forced with trying to get that money, uh, personal loan uh, against assets or a cosign with a relative or parent uh, is the is the most common way to get this done. It's very difficult to have the money, uh, you know, set aside, that kind of money set aside. I mean, most people just don't do that. Uh, there's a GI Bill. If you have ever been in the service, you could potentially finance it with a few schools that offer GI Bill training uh, through the GI Bill. There are scholarships, and there's a lot of scholarships that people don't realize are there. Uh, AOPA offers some scholarships. Flight Training Magazine has a list of scholarships. If you'll Google flight training scholarships online, there's a number of uh, books and things that show what those are. So there could potentially be some help. A lot of the minority organizations, Women in Aviation, uh, OBAP, the Black uh, Aviation Professionals, uh, Gay Pilots and Latino Pilots all have scholarship programs that might help you if you're in that category. Um, the Gateway Programs, the uh, programs that have been started by all the big airlines now have started programs to bring pilots in with zero time and take them through. M many of them start with pilots in college. So if you don't have your college and you're going to go, then they like to pick people up in their second or third year of college and take them right through out of college into flight training or with flight training in college into a small airline, working as an instructor first and then a small airline, and eventually end up at airlines like Federal Express or Delta, American, or United. So those are, are great programs. They're going to probably be on hold for a while. You probably can apply. They're not going to be processing applicants until they begin to need pilots again. Although if they're, if they're thinking about it, they're, it's going to take years, three or four years, five years to get through that program. By then, they'll be needing pilots again. So those that are forward thinking may continue these programs at least partially uh, during the downturn. The, uh, what most people do uh, is work, save, and fly. And by that, I mean they work hard, save extra money, save enough and set enough time aside to get a particular license, let's say the private license or the instrument rating. They save that up, they go get it. And the reason I say save it up first, if you do it piecemeal and you don't finish for whatever reason, you run out of money, the weather's bad, you break your toe. Whatever it is, if you don't finish, you end up coming back later, you often have to start over and spend that same money again. So have the time, have the money, work, save, and fly to a license. Make sure you get the license. Then if you have to take a break, work and save again, that's fine, and then get the next license. But don't stop short of getting the license or that will basically melt away over the few weeks or months that intervene. Uh, and then there's all types. Of the, the people that are really expert on financing would be the schools that use that financing. So if you're going to look for financing, you might want to talk to the schools that have financing available. They will be expert on what's available and how to get it. Wow. Okay. And I should actually add that Sling Pilot Academy themselves also have a scholarship uh, around the range of $20,000 almost every year. So you can look into that as well. Something that I find a little hard to believe is how, again, aviation just seems like a different world compared to everything else that somebody can go to school for or, or build a career out of because I'm surprised that you don't have an option to maybe get a student loan to become a pilot because to me it's like, want to be a medical doctor. You can go to medical school and you can get a student loan for that. Being a pilot is a legitimate career and it just feels so completely separate from mm -hmm. either any traditional colleges. You know what I mean? So I, I find that really weird. And again, this is part of why it's harder for more people to get into the industry because these options are, are 
a little far fetched. They're they're not mm. as available as just about everything else. But it is a legitimate career. And as Kid has said, there are options for you. You can approach the school. They can help you find you know a good financing or. Uh, you can take loans out, personal loans, whatever the case may be. But I do think some rules need to change as to giving people more opportunities to be able to get something similar to a student loan to to pursue a, a power career. Um, well, Mike, let me talk about that just a little bit. You, okay. you can get loans to learn to fly, but they're almost, most all, not all, but most are associated with colleges. So if you go to college that offers flight training as part of the curriculum, then you can get the traditional student loan. Uh, to do that. And the trouble is there's limits on how much you can spend each year and flight training spends that very quickly. So you typically have to go to school for a number I of see. years and learn to fly along the way. So there are some student loans available. Uh, the, what happened to the general credit was uh, we had a downturn, a 9-11 and a recession, and a lot of the funding options were restricted because people weren't able to fulfill their loans. So it's starting was starting to come back and, and financing was improving options were improving and now we have another hard economic hit so uh it they are available um scholarships a great great way to go loans and traditional financing we maybe we should talk a little bit about 141 versus part 61 training because yes. most of the schools that offer the uh, school associated training are 141 and it's they will tell you uh, and it's true that you can get qualified in less flight time and therefore save money, which is is technically true. But what we find is that most people take longer to get their private or their instrument or commercial than the minimum time by law. So that 141 school can get you a private license, I believe, is in 35 hours versus a uh, Part 61 school, which would be 40 hours. However, the facts are that most people take 60 hours to get their private license. So it doesn't really matter one or the other. What would matter was that the 141 school, especially one associated with a college, might have better access to some of those financing options than the 61 school. Uh, really, the training is very much an individual uh, event between you and a flight instructor. So you can go to a really small school with one or two instructors and get terrific flight instruction from a really good flight instructor. Or you can go to a large professionally oriented school and get lousy instruction from an instructor that's not that good. So it's really important for you as an individual to find a good instructor, whether it's at a large school or a small school. And remember, you're the customer. So if you're not happy with what you're getting from your instructor, don't hesitate to change. You are the customer. And if you're not getting along or learning well from your instructor, you need a different instructor. Make sure you get what you pay for. Makes sense. And this is something that I've discussed in depth in some of the videos I have on the channel because based on my experience, I had some, some challenges there. But that's that's a great advice. You know, anyone who's in flight training, make sure you're you're staying ahead of your training and you don't have to stay at a bad school or with a bad instructor if you're not going far, if they're not getting you as far as you need. Okay, so let's jump into the, the work experience. And I don't have a lot of questions here. But some of the viewers have asked as to what their lifestyle is going to be like. Uh, personally, one of the reasons I didn't pursue the commercial route is because I know that I'm not going to be home often. Okay, so can you talk to us a little bit about what the, the work schedule will be like for a corporate pilot, uh, airline pilot, or a cargo uh, pilot? What, what should someone who is starting out right now, what should they look forward to? Uh, or more particularly, somebody perhaps with a family or who is planning to have a family in the future? Okay, well, that's a, that's a great question because uh, it is a, on the forefront of many uh, young pilots' minds. And it's important to put some numbers with this so that uh, you know, being away from home is a relative thing. How much are you actually away from home? And we have analyzed the bid sheets at the airline. So we look at not what somebody says they fly because there are pilots, some pilots toward the end of my career, I worked eight or nine days a month. Uh, in the beginning of my career or when I was junior on an airplane, I might work uh, 18 or 20 days a month. So it really varies widely. But the average of the actual bid sheets from the airlines is about 15 days a month. Now to compare that to a nine to five job, working five days a week, you work 22 days a month. So there's a big difference, about a week off. Now these are not eight hour days. You're still putting in your time, but you're working longer, harder days, 15 days, and then you get more meaningful time off. 
So you typically work three or four days on, three or four days off, meaning you have as many days on as you do off. Instead of working seven uh, where you have five on and two off, you're typically working three on four off or four on three off, and that's a lot more time off. Occasionally, you can put those four day off periods together and have eight days off, and that's not a vacation, that's just eight days off, which you can do with it whatever you want. So there is a fair, it's hard work, but a fair amount of time off. Uh, like I said, reserves can work 18 or 20 days a month, or at least be on call that much. Compared to corporate, uh, by the way, the airline pilot, while he was doing that, he flies a lot. He flies 80, 85 hours a month for pay. Uh, and I said, not 80, not eight hour a day. So he's very efficient. He gets a lot done and then he gets good time off. Whereas a corporate pilot uh, typically works uh, 20 to 40 hours a month uh, and he's on call almost all the time. Uh, it's typically the, the uh, on call fly, wait, fly, we call it. So you're on call waiting to go. You get a call, you go fly somewhere, you sit all day or a few days while the boss does his business and then you fly back. He gets back late in the day or a couple of days later and you fly him back. So it's on call, fly, wait, fly. And the beauty of it is you're home based. You're going to have to live near your place of work. Whereas an airline, because of the three on four off kind of thing, you could potentially live anywhere. And people do. They live all over the world. Uh, I lived in Atlanta my whole career with United. I commuted to Chicago my whole career. Sounds bad, but I only went to work once a week. Uh, there were 20 some flights a day. I could fly to O'Hare, Midway, or even Milwaukee and get to work. So sounds bad, but only going to work once a week. I didn't have to fight rush hour. Uh, I tried to make my trips leave off rush hour. So I never really had to deal with that. Whereas a corporate pilot's going to be in the area of his airplane, on call, and uh, waiting for that call to go fly. When he does, once he gets where he's going, he waits until whatever business is done, and then he flies back. Um, and he's home base, which is a wonderful thing. Fractional flying, which is a timeshare airplane in the corporate world, very similar, but more efficient. They fly more, uh, and they typically have a closer to an airline schedule. The most common schedule is seven on, seven off, uh, whereas the airlines are three or four on, three or four off on average. But the seven on, seven off is a long time. Uh, my wife was furloughed for a little while from United and worked for NetJets, and she had the seven on, seven off schedule. Uh, seven on, seven off was too long to be gone. Uh, we joked the kids would get in trouble, get out of trouble, and get back in trouble <laughs> by the time mama came home. So that you are home-based, again, which means you live in your home, and they fly you to the plane and fly you back, so you don't have to worry about commuting. But the fractional flying, you know, you're very busy for you know five days, seven days at a time, and then you're off. If you're older, if you're later in life and don't have small kids, that can be a great lifestyle. But if you have uh, commitments where you need to be home on a regular basis, that's a terrible lifestyle. So uh, she actually went back to United uh, when they recalled her for one of those, and for that reason, because it was uh, it was too long to be gone at a time. So the the cargo question, uh, cargo is about 10% of airline flying. So if there's 100,000 airline pilots, there's 10,000 flying cargo at the majors. So everybody's not going to be a cargo pilot, but they get the same. Uh, working, but a lot of their work is in the at night on the back side of the clock, which does change the way you work. Uh, typically, you'll be needing to rest and your family will be up and you'll uh, be up and your family will be sleeping. So that does cause some um, family uh, interaction problems. Um, sleeping can be an issue. It's not for everybody, but a lot of people like it. You don't have to, it's not as much traffic. You know, it's quiet flying. Uh, they have good equipment, same equipment, same airplanes that they fly passengers in, they fly cargo in. So it uh, can be a great job. The pay is good. Uh, retirement is excellent. Uh, benefits are the, is competitive, uh, even slightly higher than the passenger airlines. So it is a good job, but it does have the nighttime flying, uh, and that that is not for everybody. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Okay, so that's great. Now, for somebody who, say, gets hired internationally. So one of the things that I've heard uh, newer pilots do is they go overseas to find work because uh, some overseas companies or airlines require less uh, flight hours in order to get hired. So what's your take on flying in a different country or a different environment and what, what should you look forward to in that aspect, or if it's a viable option uh, to consider? 
Well, overseas flying uh, has often been attractive, uh, particularly to young pilots who are having trouble getting the experience they need here. Um, the world does have a pilot shortage, and you would think that situation would be getting better. But th th there are several issues. Just like it's hard for a foreign national to work in the United States, you have an immigration issue. You have to have the right to work. And that typically means you need to be sponsored. Somebody over there has to need you bad enough to go to the trouble to help you get in the country. If you work at the bigger airplanes, you use crew leasing companies who gather up qualified candidates and present them to overseas airlines, and they hire them, work with the country, work with the airline. So you're going through three people, the crew leasing company, the airline, and the country to get into the country to work. And you typically can't do that as an individual. Now, there are some positions as flight instructors overseas in the smaller planes that you might be able to get into. But in most cases, immigration is an issue. They have to really need you in order to, to handle the immigration. I hate to see pilots leave what, you, what is typically the largest pilot market in the world. In the United States is a great place to be looking for a job as a pilot. We have more, more flying, more people flying, more planes than any other part of the world. So I hate to see you leave that. It's sort of hard to run a job search from China. You know, it's really hard to, to keep up on things. It's difficult to get back for an interview. So we typically say, if you can, stay put. Uh, if you get a chance overseas, it's going to be more difficult than you think because of the immigration, the right to work. And then in many cases, you have to have a foreign license to work overseas. And those licenses can be easier than ours or in some cases, much more difficult. For instance, working in Europe, you have to have a European license. And their testing is uh, extensive which means you basically have to re-qualify in order to work in that area. Uh, okay, so you guys heard that. Now, let's let's talk about the actual hiring process for someone who's just getting in the door. Like I said, they've completed everything they need to complete. I want you to, to give us an insight on what the what the hiring process is like. What What is your interview like? What kind of, how many hoops do you have to jump over? And also in that, can you discuss some of the perhaps some of some of the mistakes that newer pilots make during the hiring process? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? All right. Well, pilot uh, interviews and what to expect. Um, first of all, you have to meet minimum requirements. So each airline on their website lists their minimums. Um, there are no age limits. Uh, there are no uh, hard physical requirements, height, weight, vision, that type of stuff have all gone away, although it does help to look like a professional pilot. I mean, you, know, you, you don't want to be overweight. You can't have a lot of uh, facial hair. They probably they don't like visible tattoos, that kind of stuff. So, but looking good, uh, you're going you're gonna to make a, a resume, and the resume is going to show how you meet or exceed the minimum requirements. Um, you're going to have an, typically an electronic application some airlines will interview off a resume, but most of them have an online application system like uh, airline apps or pilot credentials. Uh, and we encourage you to get into and work on those. That sometimes have to do a little research to get all the information to complete that. Uh, and then you're likely going to get a phone call or an online assessment uh, where you do a personality inventory or answer certain questions uh, by phone or video, video call to see if you're sort of a before they bring you in, it really costs quite a bit of money to screen somebody uh, to bring you in, have you talk with a couple of captains. Um, that's a real expensive operation. So they're going to do these events they can do out away from the interview office all they can before they bring you in to talk to you. Once you get in there, uh, they're going to check your paperwork, you know, a record check. They're going to verify your licenses and medical and transcripts and driving record and all that stuff. Um, and then they're going to vary their time. You're going to typically rotate through a face-to-face -face interview, typically 30, 45 minutes, uh, for everything from tell me about yourself to uh, tell me about a time you had a conflict in the cockpit and how you resolved it. Uh, there's going to be some testing, uh, aptitude personality testing. A few airlines use cognitive testing. Federal Express and Delta do a cognitive screen. Um, and you work your way through that. Some even have you talk to a psychologist. Uh, when it's all done, uh, you're going you're gonna to leave and they're going to meet, typically not right away, but they'll get a recommendation from the interviewers and they'll sit in, in a group and look at all the results of this and make a decision in a week or two uh, about whether to hire you. 
In the meantime, they'll do a background check. So the things that you've written on your resume, your application, what you say in the interview will be cross-checked against the background check. And if they don't line up, then they could either not hire you as a result or ask you why they don't line up. Um, so it's important to be consistent between the resume, the application, the interview, consistent with what they'll find in the background check. So they don't know the truth, but they do know inconsistency. So if you're not consistent in what you present, that puts up a flag. They don't know whether you made a mistake or were trying to hide something. Wow. Can you talk to us about some of the common mistakes that uh, a new applicant makes and how they can correct that? And also give us an idea of the timing. Like, how long does this process take for someone who's just applying? Okay, well, the mistakes, probably the biggest mistake is not being prepared. You need to, to take this interview seriously. The average career value being pay, benefits, and retirement for a person hired at 35 and working 30 years is $10 million in today's dollars. We're talking really big money. So it would be a serious mistake not to take it seriously and prepare. And the thing is, as an individual, you don't know your own weaknesses. We're not that good at evaluating ourselves. So you might think, well, I'm okay. I'm, I'm pretty smart. I did well in school. I don't need to prepare for the written testing. I'll be okay. Not true. You might be thinking, you know, I fought, I've got 6,000 hours. I'm a qualified pilot. I can pass this simulator evaluation. No problem. Big mistake. You know, you need to prepare for each portion of this interview as if you weren't uh, prepared, as if you weren't uh, confident in your in your ability. You need to, to bone up on the written. You need to practice for the simulator. You need to work on your personal interview. I always make the comparison. You know, people say, well, I'm really good at this. And I say, okay. Uh, how does your first ILS look? And they say, well, it was a little, a little shaky, you know? And I said, well, this is your first interview. How do you think that's going to look? It's going to be a little shaky. Wouldn't it be good to get a little practice to, to bone up on these things so that when you get in there, we don't want you handling things the first time in the interview. That's a 50, 50 proposition that could cost you $10 million. So don't do that. Do your homework. Study, prepare, practice, just like you would for an air, airline maneuver. If you were going to take a check ride, you would practice the maneuver before the check ride. Well, this is a check ride. Do your homework, practice the maneuver. Uh, the next thing is to know yourself. You know, we're looking for people. Uh, machines have become very reliable. The weather is very predictable. Um, all the things that used to get us in trouble, mechanical failures and all, they don't happen very often. The real problems today are with pilots, you know, we haven't, we've gotten better, much better, but we're looking for people that know themselves, that recognize their own problems and can talk about them, that play well with others, that work well with other pilots to make a collective decision on what to do if something goes wrong. And we want people that can use those skills to solve problems. It's called CRM, Cockpit Resource Management. You're basically a manager of yourself, the other resources and people in the cockpit, and you use those resources to solve problems successfully. If you do that, we don't crash. If you don't do a good job of that, we might. So we're looking for people that are really good at solving problems. And to do that, they have to be self-aware, play well with others, and that use those skills to solve problems. Uh, paperwork not being complete. So if they tell you to do things a certain way, to bring something, uh, to complete it this way, you need to do that. I mean, this is, again, a very serious game. And there will be other people that will follow the rules, do the paperwork, bring what they're supposed to bring. You want to drive them nuts? Show up with a, a piece of, without a piece of required paperwork. They can't hire you. You know, they said bring this, bring your transcripts. You didn't bring them. They said bring a driving record. You didn't bring it. You know, you've got to do those things, and which means you have to start early. You need to start about a year out gathering these things because you're going to call the registrar's office for the transcripts, and they're going to say, well, it's uh, COVID and we're closed, and we'll be open in a few months. But you've got an interview, and you don't have a few months. So starting a year out to get all this together is good. And finally, handling disclosure items. Everybody makes mistakes. Accidents, incidents, violations, training failures. People have problems along the way. It's how you deal with those. Uh, you have to be honest about them. They're going to find out about them. If you don't tell them and they find out about it, one of the things they're not going to deal with is dishonesty. You know, They'll deal with a lot of problems. I've seen people hired with 10 checkride failures. But if you don't tell them about one, that's going to sink your boat. So you have to present your disclosure items, and that's one of the things you might want to practice in a practice interview, talking comfortably about a problem where 
we think, you know, it's a $10 million job and I've, and I've got to tell them about a problem. We don't want to do that. So we have to get comfortable with it. If you can't get comfortable with it, it's very difficult for them to get comfortable with it. The way for you to get comfortable with it is to practice it. Talk, it, talk about it several times before the interview. So how long does it take? So if you're just fully qualified and you apply, we typically say it takes six months to get a job. Uh, if it's hard times, like we're coming up on now, it might be more like a year. So that's why you need to start well in advance. Uh, going through the steps, basically, it's going to take you nine months to a year to qualify your initial qualifications. You're going to have to bill flight time toward uh, 1,500, 1,200 hours. That's going to take another 18 months or so. Uh, my goal for you at the regional carrier, if you were working toward a major, would be 2,000 hours total time. Um, I'm sorry, 2,000 hours turbine PIC, meaning 2,000 hours as a captain. You get about 1,000 hours a year, so you need to make captain as quick as you can and fly captain for a couple of years, and that's a lot of qualifications. By then, the average civilian pilot hired has about 5,000 hours. Plenty of people hired with less than that. Uh, my son was hired with, uh, at 28 with 3,300 hours. So you, it can be done in less, but if you have a plan for 2,000 hours turbine PIC, you make decisions along the way to get that, then you will end up in a good position with your career. You'll probably get hired sooner. In the future, the minimums will come down, but have a plan for 2,000 hours turbine PIC, and you can't go wrong if you're shooting for the majors. Wow. So a lot there. That's quite a bit of process. Now, what do you do if you get rejected? Well, it does happen. And back when I was doing it, they hired one out of 10. Um, I said the hiring process is very expensive, so they've gotten a lot better. Um, Delta Airlines, for instance, hires about three quarters of the people they interview. So it's gone from 10% to 75%, a dramatic increase. Wow. But still, people are rejected. If you're rejected, there's, there's usually um, a couple of categories. <laughs> the first one is uh, come back in six months or come back in a year. You know, they might, if, they, if they're okay, but you made a mistake along the way, they want, to, want you to get more experience, they'll tell you to reapply and you can come back. And occasionally we get the uh, don't come back. So that, that happens when it's typically a personality thing. You know, if you uh, are immature in the interview, uh, argue with people, you know, the, the obvious social uh, mistakes you can make, if you exhibit those in the interview, then you're likely not to be asked back. So, uh, so in most cases, no is not no. No is, is going gonna, is gonna to be later. But there are a few cases where no is no because you – uh, had a, you were a bad actor in the interview. Uh, and they're watching all the time. I mean, they're watching if you're riding the bus or riding the plane to get there, if you're in the waiting room talking to others, if you're at the hotel or riding the hotel van. If you make a mistake, you're ar you know arguing with the receptionist about something that she's asked you for, you better know that she knows where to do that. Interesting. Right, so they're always watching. The next thing like we said before, is to practice. You know, if you don't get rejected, if you get rejected, there, there may be a reason. You know, uh, maybe you're rubbing your nose or, you know, you didn't look professional in your attire. Um, you can get better and practice makes you better. So, you know, get practice either with a company like mine where we can do a practice interview or simply the act of taking more interviews. It only takes one, one company to say yes. Everybody doesn't have to say yes. So if you if you the best news ever is to get the first interview because if you qualify for one company guess what you probably qualify for a lot of other companies so you're going to get additional interviews you want to take advantage of those by being better prepared and more relaxed you know the best interviews I ever had were airlines I didn't care whether I got the job or not so by relaxing and being yourself you'll have a better performance uh, be patient and persistent a lot of times when people are rejected they go into a funk. You know, they, yeah. they withdraw, they're mad as hell, they're not going to take it anymore, uh, they drop out for six months or a year. Well, in a seniority-based business where it's important to get the job as soon as possible, dropping out for a year is a really bad idea. What I would say is patience and persistence. Don't let that rejection stop your continue to build time, build experience, get better at what you do, get more recommendations, continue to, to pressure your job search toward your goal. And that will produce the best result. Um, wow. The odds are better than ever. If you've been interviewed one time, uh, that's the best news because I know you're going to get other interviews and you'll have the practice of the first one. It's very not uncommon not to get hired on the first interview. I would actually advise people if they had a choice, dream company and number two, 
take number two first. You'll do better in the second one by, because you've had some practice. It's the same theory that practicing with my company before you go in, you know, practice makes perfect. Recommendations are to get recommendations. Uh, our, our statistics show that about 80% of the people that are hired are recommended. So the people you know at these companies are very important. And it would be ideal if it was a pilot or even, even better yet, a pilot you've flown with. But a flight attendant or a mechanic or anyone that works at that company. And the reason the recommendation from the company is essential is accountability. It's important for them to work for the company so they know the company and they can say that you would be a good fit. If they don't know the company, they couldn't possibly say that. And then if they say you'd be a good fit, but you turn out not to be a good fit, there's accountability. The company knows where you live. You recommended Bob and Bob turned out to be a jerk. And they can say, hey, you recommended Bob, and we know where you live. We're going to say, if you can't do better than that, don't make recommendations. Bob was a jerk. So accountability makes for a much more powerful recommendation. So you re if you want to apply to, say, five companies, which would be the minimum we would suggest, then you now need at least five recommendations. And we would really want you to get three or four at each company. So now instead of five, you need 20. That's a full-time job, trying to get 20 recommendations. So recommendations are a key part. Keep track of people. When you train people or people train you, you have managers, instructors, keep up with them. They're going to be the airline and be in a position to recommend you in the future, and you need to stay in touch. You're going to be sending uh, Christmas cards and birthday cards and buying beers, whatever it takes, a date, date the ugly sister, whatever it takes. You're going to have to make and keep good recommendations. The next step would be uh, have a professional resume and professional application. Normal online resume advice does not hold for pilots. Pilots uh, have a set one-page format, and the airlines need to see certain information on it. The same with the application. Your, your wife may be able to spell and punctuate, but she can't necessarily help you with an airline application because she doesn't know enough about aviation to maximize your score. Uh, like I said, apply to at least five companies. Attend job fairs. You know, people love hiring people. They hate hiring a number or a statistic. They hate looking at the paperwork and trying to decide if somebody's a good guy. They love it when you walk up at a job fair, hand them your resume, shake their hand, and talk a little bit, and they see that you're a good guy. That's a bonding experience. What they do is collect those resumes. They go back and sort them into three piles, the no ways, the maybes, and the red hots. And what they do is correlate their red hots to their electronic applications on file, and that's when you get a call for an interview. That my son was went to Women in Aviation, a minority. He's not a woman, <laughs> you know. He went to Women in Aviation, uh, and he got an email from him to be sure to put his Women in Aviation affiliation on his application. The window wasn't open. The window opened shortly thereafter. He got an interview and got hired, and I'm convinced that he did that at Women in Aviation. There are other minority organizations that have job fairs and annual meetings that you need to go to. I mentioned them earlier, OBAP for the black airline pilots, gay pilots, Latino pilots. You need to join these organizations and go to their annual meeting, at least one of them. And the largest would be women in aviation. Uh, the others are smaller, but the, ma the majors and most of the regionals still go. Follow up. At a meeting like that, a lot of times they'll say, you know, my name's Jane and you're not quite there yet, but here's my card. When you get to 1,500 hours, give me a call. You need to do that. Jane probably makes the decision about whether you get an interview or not. So don't hesitate to follow up. Um, prepare for the interview like it was uh, your job dependent on it. We already talked about that. Right. And dress for success. You know, you don't want to go in there in your pink shirt and green velour suit. You want to look like uh, the banker, the IBM salesman. And there is a book called Dress for Success. Follow it. I don't care what you normally look like. You need to look like you would look good in their uniform. And what you wear should come close to their uniform. You know, that, look at a pilot at that airline and say, that's what I need to look like. I need them to visualize me as a pilot at American, Delta, United, or if it's a smaller airline, Republic, PSA, whatever. Makes sense. Okay. All right, guys. So there you have it. We've covered a lot. And actually, we're, we didn't get to direct viewer questions yet, but stay tuned for the next video series and we'll answer directly some of the questions that you guys have asked. But I hope you took a lot from this. And also, if you have more questions, just leave in the comment below and hopefully we'll be able to get to those in the next session. Hope you guys enjoy this video. If you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Also, I'm going to leave a link to Kit 
uh, company and their services in the description below. Make sure you guys check it out. And uh, also, if this is your first time, make sure you subscribe with notification bell on. And I will catch you on the next video. Safe.